Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I am interviewing Kane Berlinger. Kane is an old school leather man, and I'm very honored to be able to have him part of the chat series. Hi, Kane. Hi, Doug. All right. <laughs> when I was preparing for this, when we were both preparing for this interview, I learned that uh, you are one of the most celebrated leaders in the leather community. Why do people say that about you? Uh, probably because uh, I've been around a long while. And uh, <laughs> that, that's usually the whole uh, sum of it is that you, you just have to be there. You know, and there was, and I was there a lot when there was, um, when we were in our heyday and we had events and we had runs and there were very few people of color present. And usually I was the only one there, probably because I liked the attention. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> well, being one person of color and feeling fulfilling so many people's dark fantasies. It was almost a given. <laughs> Dark fantasies? Well, <laughs> that'll be covered later in the interview. <laughs> All right, that's fine. But do you see yourself as a community leader? Um, I found myself placed in that position because people do ask me a lot of questions about the community. At the time, it was a lot of questions about um, uh, about race in the community, because as I said, that because there were so few of us in the community, people that wanted to know more or ask questions that they didn't feel comfortable about, and they felt comfortable around me, so they would come to me and ask me questions, like. Um, at certain events, people would be into race play at the time. And for some reason, they would, they would kind of seek me out. And I don't know whether it was, uh, some of it was just to inform me this was going on or that to like, ask my approval. I don't think it was for invitations because they never got any. Mm. But <laughs> a lot of people asked me you know, my feelings on the subject which led to my writing of my book, uh, Black Men in Leather and Why You See Them, uh, because so many of those questions were being asked of me. Okay. So, I found, so I was kind of placed in that role. And then there were a lot of panels coming out at the time. And uh, I think there were probably more, more events then also. I mean, because of the pandemic and everything, but even prior to that, I think the meetings were going down a little because when the internet started, there was less, uh, it was all done on, online. It was no longer the events, the gatherings and stuff where you could get panels together and uh, talk to people. Well, you know, we're doing it now on Zoom these days, but then we actually got people together and they felt better about uh, asking questions and things that they wanted to know. Then they were curious. I think I think a lot of that's coming back now. You used you used an interesting word a moment ago. You used the word approval. Mm -hmm. Why were people asking for your approval? For the same reason that uh, they had political correctness come out and. Uh, People weren't always comfortable using rich words. Uh, oh, well, you're seeing a lot of that now, you know, um, especially with the, with all the new speak and all the, the, the new dialogue, and people don't know what to say now. You know, if you're running into uh, transgender people, you don't know whether to use the term him, her, sis, whatever. I'm still at, at odds because I'm still speaking you know, like I'm back in 76, you know, and all the new kids are, you know, what? You know, <laughs> and, I, and I end up uh, uh, unintentionally offending people because I just simply don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. It used to concern me, but I figure at my age now I can just 
chalk it up to being cute. My, <laughs> gran my grandpa at the Thanksgiving table, you know. <laughs> uh, before we go too far, though, I'd, I'd like to go back to sort of uh, the starting point of this. You're originally from Ohio. So am I. Oh. And uh, tell me a little bit about how you emerged into the community, coming out as a gay man, coming out into the kink community. How did that start for you? Okay, coming out was, I would say, I, 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 I don't think I officially came, well, it depends on what you mean by coming out. Uh, when I was a young, a young guy, in New York, growing up in New York, because we moved from Ohio to New York. Uh, I was about nine or 10. Oh, I see. And as I got further on, uh, New York was different then. It was a lot different. And one of the things that were different were the public washrooms, which 20, a 20 cent uh, token would take you on the subway and you could ride all up and downtown. Well, while doing that, you discovered that that dime that went in there opened up doors to, to sexual playgrounds that uh, became later baths, back rooms and stuff. And uh, uh, you would say my coming out would have been there because there was the, uh, the private places. There was where everybody was using, was using these uh, public facilities as play spaces. And that, you could do a whole story and a whole book just on that alone. And eventually that spilled over into my school you know, where I went to Dewey Clinton, which was an all boys school at the time. And uh, it just kind of happened. There was no great uh, epiphany or anything. I mean, there were always incidents in the, the, the public washrooms and the back stairs of schools and uh, uh, your fellow students who would be experimenting like you and in the gym room and this would happen and... There were just there were stories I'm wondering whether I should tell or not. <laughs> we're going to edit this later, right? <laughs> yes. But I'd love to know how did you even know about these public washrooms? It was just by accident. I we lived in uh, White Plains, and I think we, the school was in White Plains. I think it was um, it's so many years ago. Anyway, I took the subway. I have to take the subway there. And no doubt, innocently, a little boy had my dime. I had to use the facilities. And as I say, the rest is history. <laughs> and, and, this, and this went on for many, many years until one day some uh, public citizen said, we should not pay those extra dimes because we're paying the uh, fare. So we should have use of the facilities. But the, those dimes were paying for the maintenance. Mm. When those dimes stopped coming, the maintenance stopped coming. And meh, it's now like, you know, the home of God knows what. <laughs> so you don't see them in action anymore. So like the way of the dodo and all the venues, they just kind of passed on to the next, the next new thing. So, but uh, yeah, that's pretty much how it came. And then I remember I had, I was living in, uh, on my own at, at a certain age after I left school and I was sitting down, uh, I was visiting my mother, who lived in Richmond Hill, Queens at the time. And, when, and she sat down to, and she just said to me, Perry, she just came out and said, Kane, are you gay? And I was very defiant, right? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> and she said, oh, I just wanted to know. Wow. 
that was it. <laughs> so I'm always wondering if it was coming out. I, I don't really remember coming out. It just smoothly moved along. So I was very happy. And my mother and I, have, uh, up until her death in uh, 97, I believe, we had a very good relationship. We had a very close relationship. Uh, my All my lovers were good to my mother because, you know, you want to get to any gay man, be good to his mother. <laughs> so mine were, were always good, so, yeah. What was your first experience in one of those public toilets, one of the washrooms? Oh, I don't know. I mean, was it shocking to you, surprising? Not Titulating? really, because my earliest memory of touching another male came on my fifth birthday. Oh. My fifth birthday party. I was uh, five years old. And let's see, hold on a second. I'll give you a treat. <laughs> I hope you can get this. Let's see. Photos, yes. Yes, yes. can you see that one? A little bit, not well, but... That good okay, one? yes, yes. Okay, now... I'm not... That's... I'm the, the one in the light shirt is my childhood friend Tyrone. Okay. And that was taken on my fifth birthday party. And when they were bringing out the cake, they were looking for me. And me and Tyrone were out in the backyard touching each other's pee-pee. <laughs> that was my first and earliest experience. And I still have it on my wall of fans. <laughs> so... So that, that, that's pretty much how, and then there were like little, little incidents, you know, because I was often on my own a lot because my parents separated off and on. And uh, we were left with the neighborhood kids and we were all experiencing whatever it is you experience at that age. You know, you're playing in the local parking lot or there's a city dump nearby or something. Just, you know, when you're a kid, everything is magic. Yes. You know, and in any place your parents aren't there and you have free reign with your friends, you know, the sky's the limit. <laughs> and you experience so many things. You know, I would like to say I was abused, but unfortunately I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to learn it all on my own. These kids today, they're all abused. It's too easy. <laughs> Please, nobody take offense at that. It was a joke. <laughs> well, you, you were living in New York City when you were young, and that was a very um, unique time, I think. Very different from the New York City we know today. Oh God, yeah, sure. Tell me about some of the differences you notice or things that you know about that. What arena, in the sexual arena? Both, both that and regular. Well, let's say, uh, when I was uh, coming up, um, let's say about from 17, I, I thought the world revolved around 42nd Street, especially the gay world. I didn't do anything. I just liked walking up and down the streets. And at that time, I was 300 pounds also, I should point out. And there are no immediate pictures of that anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I was uh, big at that time. And uh, I would just walk up and down 42nd from 8 to 6 eight to six, just, just <laughs> thing the people that were obviously gay. Excuse me. And, and, uh, <clears throat> they were attractive and they were sexually appealing. 
And I just like looking. And then eventually, uh, there was a line of theaters. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of old movies with theaters all on. And I went to some of the X movies. And they were straight. They weren't gay ones. They were straight ones. Okay. And, and there was... Uh, there was some activity in the uh, audience, which observant young man that I am, <laughs> I saw that. And uh, then later on, a friend of mine that I had, uh, went to school with, well, he was kind of a friend of me. He asked me also if I was gay. And also another person I was, I wanted to throw it in someone's face because I had been... Uh, I had been kind of socially conditioned that this was a bad thing. Right. And uh, whenever I was going to, someone asked me, I would say, yeah, I'm gay, God damn it. What, what about it? But <clears throat> that was not the reaction I got. And uh, he, my, my friend, he said to me, he says, so have you been to Christopher Street? And I said, no. He said, how can you say you're gay and you've never been in Christmas Street? And I said, okay. And I put it off for about a week or two weeks. And then I decided one night that I was kind of bored with 42nd Street. And I mm -hmm. said, well, let's see what's happening on this Christopher. Well, as it were, it turned out to be, I think it was the night after or the day after, the Stonewall riots. Wow. And I went down there, and all I saw were just this explosion of gay men. And I walked from 6th, again, from 6th Avenue, all the way down to, to the, uh, at the time, where the warehouse is. Okay. And I must have made that walk about 20 times in one night. And at the time, I had a curfew because I was still in high school, I think, then. And my curfew was, uh, first it was midnight, and then it was dawn, depending on the grade I was in. When I was my senior year, my mother said, be home before the sun comes up, which was really kind of rushed and pushing it. And uh, I just walked back and forth, just my mouth, like, hanging. And uh, the people you met on the way, I mean, um, Sylvia and uh, Marsha were already out there already. I knew them all, and we, we were all hanging out. Because at the time, when I left school, and I also was working, and a lot of those people weren't working. They were the street people there. And they were activists because they were there. If you were there and you opened your mouth, time will record it. I mean, look what's happened with Marsha and Sylvia. You know, they didn't, I'm sure they didn't set out to be activists. But uh, history has recorded them as that because... They spoke out. They 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 championed the cause, and I think anybody in that time, we had to march. It was just where you had to be, and uh, yeah, that's where we were. And that's that's how my thing kind of gradually kind of got more into it. Now, of course, the longer I was out there, I lost about. I went from a forty-four waist size to a 30, to a 31 wow. in three months. <laughs> That's a lot of walk, right? Yeah. I remember the pair of gray pants who just went like this. And uh, when, I, when I went back into school, People didn't recognize me. It was great. So, for the benefit of the audience, for people who may not know uh, to whom you're referring, would you please explain who Marsha and Sylvia were? See, I just assume people know. 
<laughs> uh, but I'm I'm thinking there may be some young person out there seeing. I'm sure there are. That. I'm sure yeah. there are. Yeah. And you know, fortunately, there's a lot of a lot of documentaries and stuff have uh, told about it. They were they were activists who, who simply advocate, advocated gay rights and gave us uh, a voice and took us to politicals. Because, un, you know, unlike uh, popular opinion has it that, oh, the Stonewall riots came and the next day life was a bowl of cherries. It was not like that at all. As a matter of fact, uh, I think maybe a week later, there was a... Um, shit. There was... A, what the heck was the name of that club? There were, there were two clubs. One was called the Psychedelic Shack, I think. And the other one was something that started with P. It'll come to me. Or maybe not. But the clubs were raided and furniture was slashed and uh, the place was defaced. All like a week or two later, mm -hmm. there was another club at the end of Christopher called Christopher Inn. That I remember because... <laughs> That used to be uh, the doors for the, the music be playing at one at night, and suddenly the DJ plug would be pulled on the video box on the jukebox, and they say, "Okay, it's a raid." And I've, all the customers knew to pile out, while sources went in, collected the money, went out. Then you know you circled the block and you came back in. And those those raids were were still pretty ongoing even after and during Stonewall, so it did take a lot a lot more time after for that to occur. So, tell us a little bit more about uh, Marcia and Sylvia. That was Marcia Johnson, yes, and Sylvia Riviera. Right. right. Okay. Well, there there isn't much I could tell except that it. Uh, when we had to sit in at NYU because they weren't going to do dances anymore. They were there for that. And a lot of the street kids that came to them, uh, they usually went to them because they were the eldest. And they were, as, as I see it now from, from visual, not from experience, that they did take care of a lot of these kids. And they all had a thing going. And I remember we had, because uh, I was living partially at home and I was working still. So I wasn't uh, living on the streets. But uh, the times you had, like at night, you would go down to uh, the Silver Dollar restaurant. <coughs> and we didn't have a lot of money. But we would go in there at like one at night and the truckers would be there. And we'd be hanging on to one cup of coffee for most of the night, just just thinking of new uh, reading, new dish lines to do. I mean, like it was the people were enormously clever and witty. I wish I had written down a lot of the things that you'd heard. I mean. You know, and they, and they would it would be like rapid fire. You know, you can you really? I, I, I Ryan Murphy did a good thing with Pose. He captured just that little bit of it with the dancing, and that was one of the things I missed. I didn't do the ballrooms, and uh, I I had different goals, and I wanted to get out of Queens. <laughs> I didn't think the ballrooms would get me there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, I, did, I, I knew them. I knew them to talk to them and to share stuff with them. And uh, I'm trying to pull up memories, but they're very few. I didn't, they weren't, they were friends. You know, they were like, oh, they were special, we were close. I mean, at that time, especially coming in from the 60s, uh, the new people, a lot of people from the uh, the Velvet Underground, from Andy Warhol's group, 
you know, and, and, and Holly Woodlawn would be there. Um, what else would we know through that? That entire, that entire group, was, they, they weren't special because they were friends, you know. They were talented, but not to us. They just could do stuff. Later now, it's like, oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. Well, Capturing memories and trying to stick to a timeline and trying to remember names isn't always easy when you get to a certain point. <laughs> yes. I, I do know that today, Marsha Johnson and Sylvia Rivera are viewed with a bit of iconic status. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Well, like I said, it was just a matter of being there and being allowed. I, I don't think they, I didn't know them well enough to see that they possessed any particular swaying power. I don't, they weren't marching to the halls of Congress or anything. They were doing what any of us in that era did. They just happened to be probably at every event and, uh, but there were others of us who were at every event and who were loud, you know. And, and they were always, by their appearance alone, was always exceptional. You know, they didn't necessarily blend into the crowd. <laughs> so, you know, well, in, in our crowd, they blended in, but in, to the outside, you know, they didn't, you know. I remember... You know the first the first gay pride, you know, it was just that that little stretch of land <laughs> on Christopher, and it was it was that was to me at, at that age all that time was magic. Yeah. You know, I just we just viewed uh, my partner and I we just viewed uh, uh, the village people, and you can't stop the music last night or yeah. on <laughs> on uh, Prime. And I was I was in heaven now because the whole because I knew a place, the people, the area, everything. And I remembered that that movie was not particularly well received at the time. And then you're reading the reviews now, and it's like four and a half stars, and it's like it personified the musical comedy era of that time, and. Uh, and I'm going like, oh my God, yeah, all you have to do is just be there. Just if you can outlast the critics, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything becomes fine. I mean, when when people started at, at this point calling me uh iconic or legendary and stuff like that, I it was like it was flattering, of course, but I'm thinking, I didn't really do anything, I was just there. <laughs> <laughs> and I raised my hand, you know, and, you know, putting things together is, you know, I'm a bit of a control freak, so that's going to happen anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I speculate <laughs> that a lot of people, particularly my generation and younger, wish we had been able to be part of that magical time. So for us to hear it from someone who lived it is fascinating. So. I think, and I was commenting also on this last night too, is that I think every young person's life normally, just because you're younger and probably prettier and more vital, it is a magic time, no matter what things are going through. And I'm and I'm thinking my life wasn't particularly golden. I mean, I had a, I, I had I had a good uh, nothing to complain about during my life and stuff. And I'm thinking like during these years, though, when there was all this crime and all this dirt and all this uh, and people were saying how horrible it was to me. I think it was magic. <laughs> Everything was magical, you know you. You'd go out at two and you'd see celebrities all the time and and people that were doing stuff and the clothes, the the mood, the the the, the music. And I wasn't even doing drugs. 
and I, I can imagine what other people were, were going through. So, so I think, and I, I try to now, when I tell these things, when people ask me and so forth, I try not to glamorize it too much because I don't want to make small of what they're doing. Mm. You know, it's like, oh, you know, like, oh, yeah, you should have been there then. That, oh, that was really something. This is eh. And then you think, they're going to think you're a piece of crap and their life sucks because of you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, you do something like 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 Mid Atlantic now, you know, which is different from what it used to be. Uh, perfect example is I, I didn't go there for years because I hated the weather, and I finally took a bus one day and went, and I was just blown away, mostly by the ice sculpture around the buffet thing they used to have at ice, and it was. And now, of course, you know it's. Eh. You know, it's, it's nice <laughs> for no ice sculpture. Uh. <laughs> but I, I, I try to uh, put a little bit in there because we create, we, you know, it was a, a different time. You know, now a lot of people are going to the internet and they're going to make something out of it. Maybe the people are realizing that contact is best. Maybe something... Something to come out of it. I'm a writer, and they say what well, science fiction writers write will come true. So maybe what I write <laughs> will come true. We could hope. Yes. Let's look at your writing a little bit because it's absolutely fascinating. You looked at my stuff? Well, I looked at what I can. <laughs> and I would like to know, I, I rather, let me rephrase that. You've said that you came of publishing age during the outlaw brashness of New York City in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean to you? How do you explain that? Uh, at, the, at the time, uh, the city was in the throes of the mafia, so, so it says. And I had, I had started writing when I was... Uh, in school, I wrote comic books. I did a lot of little graphic novels and things by hand. And uh, so I had a bit of, a bit of an imagination. And I'm not sure when I decided to actually put serious pen to paper. But when I decided I wanted to write, I don't even remember what the first thing was I wrote. I would like to say other voices, other rooms, but no. Um, <laughs> but that's someone else. And uh, I said, okay, I'll write this. And I wanted to write, write. I wanted to write. And all the venues that you had, Christian writing, romantic writing, uh, novel and stuff, none of it seemed to pay anything. And it wasn't about the money. But you know what they say when they say it's not about the money, it's about the money. But it really was. <laughs> but it really wasn't because you get paid a penny per word, that sort of thing. You send it out, you get so long to, uh, we'll look at it, we'll get back to you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but when I started writing for the gay magazines, which was also a, a, a chance, it's kind of a, if you can dig up the history on that, the, the owners, they said to me, they, they would tell you, we get it, we'll read it. If we take it, we'll take it. If we, and you will print it, you'll get the check when the issue comes out. If we don't want it, we'll let you know within a week whether we want it or not. So it was really kind of snap, snap, snap. And that was wonderful because I wrote a lot and I was getting, I got, I got a few rejections, of course. Not a lot, not a lot, not a lot to pay for anything. Very few. And on occasion, I, I would read on one where they would change something in it without consulting me. Mm. But I got paid so much. <sighs> and, then, and then, you know, it, 
which is why I very rarely reread uh, anything. Once it's published, I don't look at it anymore. And uh, but they were they would come with uh, incredible artists would we be illustrating my stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think eventually I wrote for uh, Drummer Magazine, which wasn't mob owned then. It was never a mob owned, don't get me wrong. This was after that period of all the magazines that they were printing. They printed my story, did a brilliant editing job. Marcus Wanakot, I got to give him props. And uh, he made the story better. And the illustrations were spectacular. And my name in print. Yeah. And that was the first time that I actually really felt really proud of what I was doing. Because before I was printing a lot of stories in, in New York under the, 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 the mob things. And they, I felt they called it organized crime for a reason. Because they were certainly organized. They got that check there. They got a. When it changed hands, <laughs> when that era was over, you know, it was a whole nother kettle of fish. <laughs> uh. <laughs> you know, not to, not to say anybody was any more or less, but. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, so, but. Uh, I, I point to the drummer issue because it was a three-parter and uh, it was a real, that's when I really began to put a lot of oomph into what I was doing. And then uh, I answered a contest and uh, they called me and it was $100 and they're going to print my story. Okay. Oh, boy. Well, as it turned out, the company was uh, Love You Divine, and they printed everything I wrote. And I, I don't know whether it was, yeah, it was probably, it was a very prolific time, and I would be churning those things out like Xerox. <laughs> <laughs> and they were, they, they were great stories, what can I say? <laughs> But like every actor needs a good director, I think every writer needs a good uh, editor. Yes. And especially so because I've experienced brilliant editing and I've experienced, did he even read this? <laughs> because uh, they were just, okay, you're doing great stuff, great stuff. And I was almost overnight, I'd be banging them out because it was like, I think 2,000, 3,000 words. And I could zip that right out. And uh, then uh, they started um, putting covers to my stories. So it was my name, slashy covers. <laughs> I was in heaven. So I didn't, I, I, I was just all about the story and producing and me, me, me. And, and for a while, it, it, it did pretty good. And apparently, though, there were drags who were, they were robbing me. They weren't showing this. They were printing double ISP numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, just a whole lot of mess. But it ended up with me doing something like 80, 80 stories and boil it down to like eight anthologies of about 20 a piece. And then, you know, I did a, a series of fitness books, uh, meditation books, and of course the black men and leather thing, which was my real big thing, which was, which really deserves a second coming because the, uh, in the beginning, there were interviews that I had done with, you know, Tony de Blas and, and, and so many other names and so forth. That's the one that comes right to mind. And uh, Luke Owens was editing it for me in uh, Los Angeles. And I was during the earthquake. And I was before we were saving stuff on computer, blah, blah, blah. 
and it was lost. Oh. And it was the be- the better part of the book, even though it's 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 still good, but uh, it was a better part of it. Before we go too far into that, I'd like to take one step back, or maybe two steps back, because I Fire. read <laughs> that you love writing, you love sex and parties, and you've combined them all. How have you done that? Lies, all lies. <laughs> uh, well, when I was younger, it was easy. I was and uh, and uh, when I was about 25, I think it was, I moved to Europe. Okay. And um, that was a whole, there was a whole lot of stuff around that. My, my then uh, partner at the time was a uh, Swiss airline uh, uh, attendant. And our fare was Switzerland, Toronto, Switzerland, Toronto, because I was living in Toronto then. And uh, we moved together. And then later it was Amsterdam, Toronto, Amsterdam, Switzerland. And and in that crossfire, I opened a bar, Cuckoo's Nest. Yes. Cuckoo's Nest was the Amsterdam's first daytime back room leather bar it wasn't that in the beginning it was a cocaine tent and the police closed it down and my then partner happened to be smart enough to catch it at the moment that the landlord was there and he took over the lease and we had a bar and the bar looked uh didn't look like a bar. It certainly didn't look like it did now, like it does now. And uh, Nigel Kent, who was an Australian piercer, used to come to the bar regular. We had regulars of maybe three customers, sold about three or four beers a day. A day, yeah, that was it. <laughs> and he said to me one night in a drunken age, he said, you know what you ought to do? You ought to paint the bar pink and open it in the daytime. I said, well, we don't have the money to paint it pink, but I can open in the daytime. I did have a daytime license. And from there, the bar took off. And uh, it's still going now. We ju- I just go back for its 30, I think 35th year anniversary, I think it is. And then they, then they did me good too when I went there. You know, they, you know, yeah, here's the old guy who opened it up. Yeah. That's always rather nice, you know, because a lot of people say, I have my first thing at the Cuckoo's Nest. And I thought that was kind of nice because it was, I was, well, arguably the biggest back room in Europe. It was huge. And there were, oh, the stories you could tell on there. <laughs> well, I, I have visited, yeah, mm-hmm. I visited the Cuckoo's Nest many times. Oh, well, you all to me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was. Yeah, we had we had we had a time with it, and that's that's where all the parties came from. And uh, originally, when uh, we started the fisting parties, there was when uh, one of the fire the fire the, the firehouse used to throw parties in Amsterdam. Uh, gay parties, and they also at the time lost their lease. And I was there to catch it. And know how a Yankee, you know how I rushed and had the signs printed up that we're having a party on the full moon. I started the full moon parties, and the slings, where did they go to? The Slings at the time made a journey. They made a journey to here to Wally. Wally ended up with them from the lure. Uh, and uh, where do they make their other circle? They made, th- oh, well, the, my fisting parties that I started throwing here for the last 10 years were there also. So the Slings have been around. 
I recently sold them when the pandemic started because I wanted to get out of the business. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's how that's how the party started. And of course, when you're promoting a bar, you went and and fortunately in Europe too, where they you know you can get on the bus and be in another country. So you were always going to the parties and being promoted there and pushing the parties and and uh, every 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 party game that you had a reason to go to uh, for me, which was always promoting something, promoting a book, promoting a lifestyle, promoting a, a business. Uh, if I'm not usually if I'm not promoting something, I find I don't enjoy myself as much because I don't feel I have as much to do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like I said, I'm twiddling my thumbs. You know, so let's take a, a step back though, because I I read that your works, your writing, can be a bit shocking, and it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> what about that? Well. Um, last publisher, or the last two publishers, they, according to my now publisher, said they were marketing me to women. And a lot of the reviews came from women, and a lot of stuff that turns men on, especially in our kink scene, doesn't necessarily appeal to women. Mm. And... I have dark fantasies, and I got a lot of those from uh, living in Europe. Uh. I mean, at the time I was living there, especially with me, I kept running into a lot of people that I, I must say used me as a top. And I say that, <laughs> I put that this way because... Most of the guys I ran into, a lot of Germans, they would always act first and ask later. But it's kind of, it was kind of like, okay, here's the pad or here's the whip or here are the needles. This is what you're going to do to me. <laughs> so you're, you're kind of standing there and, you know, and I've always identified as a top, but I'm versatile, you know, just, just in case you can always learn something. But they would always, you know, this is what you're going to do. And so I always say that I can give as good as I get, but I really can't. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they trained me in such a severe way <laughs> that uh, I embraced it completely. And of course, the, the, the better at the top you are, the more the bottoms will tell people and the better your reputation is. So I worked on that. You know, ego always plays a part in it. And the, 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 uh, yeah, good times. <laughs> You've mentioned earlier uh, one of your books in particular, and that's Black Men in Leather. Yeah, um, it's a non-sexual book. Tell us about that, because I know it's it's very famous, it's well-received. Um, a, a, a lot of places you went, the people were always asking you questions, especially about the black-white dynamic. And uh, uh, Kink is, is relatively new in the black community. Kind of. Not as, it wasn't as prevalent as it was in a white community. So they would ask these questions. And I would write down and take note of some of the questions they asked. And I sent out like something like almost a thousand questionnaires. And I did a few workshops around the country too. And uh, they include, that's where I got some of the, some of the answers and some of the questions. And then I eventually put it together. And uh, at first I did it the way um, Kinko's. Kinko's was my first publisher. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. 
it was in a spiral notebook. And uh, actually, my other book, Pain, is also in a spiral notebook. And uh, now, thank goodness, it's much easier, you know, due to be self-published. And those were self-published. And uh, and every every so often, it gets a it gets a rush. It gets a rush of sales, and then another little rush of sales. You know, it's it's uh, and and a couple of scholars have told me that they use it in Washington, like you know, and in their classes or whatever. Let me put that right. Uh, Mindy, who's a, a professor that I know. She teaches in her class in Washington in Black Studies, and she uses it there. There you go. Okay, and uh, like about now, especially with the George Floyd thing, it's also people are taking an interest in it again, especially the new generation. So, and that's so why I'm just starting my work on my new foundation on uh, supporting writers of color who wish to promote our alternative lifestyle, if they were the diverse community writing about alternative lifestyles. So for instance, if a writer is having difficulties with anything, like to help them along, I'll give them a promotion. It's my way of preserving, hopefully, my legacy and helping a lot of writers. And people in the arts, because it's for screenplays, actors, dance, that sort of thing. It's it's just coming up. You'll be hearing about it later, probably after this. Let's come back to the book, though. What does the book have to tell us? Uh, it tells you about uh, how people are seeing uh, relations, black-white relations in their relationships. You're seeing how are they being perceived outside? A lot of, uh, there was a lot of hostility and a lot of, uh, you're going to be a white sla a black slave to a white master? Mm, let's talk about that. You know, what are your issues? How does that make you feel? You know, uh, can you use the term, the N-word in the, in the context of the bedroom or out of the context of the bedroom? When is it right between two kingsters to to uh, uh, degrade one or the other, humiliate that sort of thing? It's a fantasy, and you have to decide when uh, when does politics enter, or if it enters your bedroom. You know, um, what are some of the other things, and I could get a copy of the book and take, check it out. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it clearly it's definitive it's a definitive book and of, the, of, of that time unfortunately maybe still from what I'm being told <laughs> do you feel that that helped shape perhaps the next generation of people coming into the scene Um, I think it'll provide answers if I don't provide them. I hope that through the internet or whatever, other people will. But uh, people take in information differently. They may accept something from me that they wouldn't accept, say, from you or, or, or anyone else, you know. Um, um, so it depends how, and you can never tell. You never tell how that works out. Or, you know, uh, as one, one guy says in the book, uh, you know, about being kinky, we, we were always kinky, and then, but we always called it just being a freak. Yeah. So. <laughs> and, I, and actually, I never actually started using the word. I probably used it. Uh, in my writing, but it's never been something that rose constantly over in my head. Now, uh, currently, uh, I've been alerted to this new thing about nodding and transformation sex and everything. 
that supposedly is all the rage. And it's been a challenge writing that sort of thing on one hand, but on the other hand, it's all fantasy. And that and that's and that's kind of easier to write because there are no set rules for fantasies, you know. So but it's it's been a lot of fun writing it. And we're doing working on an anthology now that's all transformation. <laughs> so tell us about America's first black sex action hero, and that's Hannibal Rex. Oh, Hannibal. Love Hannibal Rex. Um, well, one day I was sitting around doing nothing, and I said, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take, I'm, I'm going to go through some of this stuff, magazines, whatever, and I'm going to pick a sentence or two, and I want to write a story around that sentence. Like Dave Chappelle says in uh, one of his Netflix specials that he writes the punchline first and then builds the joke up around it and he gets to the punchline. And uh, so that's what I did with this. And, uh, and I said, it's going to be pure jail fiction. Just, uh, it was just, it was just, bah. And I had a great deal of fun writing it. It's just the writing around it. And uh, then I had a guy, uh, a uh, Dutch boy, who offered to do the editing for me if he could masturbate while he was writing the story. I said, great. So you let me know how good it is. <laughs> so he sat in my, in, my, in my den at the time. I was living in Amsterdam. And uh, he was sitting there talking <laughs> I was that grand going, here you go. I, I forget how many stories there were. And then I, I solicited, I think, seven or eight artists to illustrate each story. And they were, they were all diverse artists, you know. Some, some names I could look up and find for you. None of the, none of the major people like you would see from the... Uh, from uh, the major leather magazines now, the glossy ones that come to mind. But good, very good artists, some that, that, that are known. And it was a different style. So it was all, and, it, and because it was like eight by 10, I included a, a box of crayons with, <laughs> with each cell. So it's kind of an adult coloring book and uh, the, the first stories were printed uh, in uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Toy SM in Denmark. And it was translated into German. And uh, I think there were about four or five stories that were printed out. And then later when I came back here, a couple of them appeared in uh, uh, black, black, leather and color, black Leather and Color. And that's when I put the, I made the stories, put them together, re-edited them, re-posted them, and put them out as the coloring book. And so they're still available. Make wonderful Christmas decorations, stock, stocking stuffers. <laughs> <laughs> but your book, uh, Sex in the Dungeon, is celebrated for saving ah. countless lives. Tell us about that. That was, uh, again, sometimes I don't remember where my inspiration was, but uh, I'm diabetic. And uh, I realized that there, there are certain things that, that actually I haven't run across, really, and in sex play, but I know of others who have <laughs> mentioned it. And uh, there's certain protocols, things you want to check, things on bondage, make sure circulation is right. Uh, you want to make sure the blood sugar is not too high, not too low, uh, things to recognize, uh, drugs that interfere with that. And, and, they, and it was a little, a little booklet that should fit into 
Well, we used to have a toy bags. Back in the day, we went to the bars and we had toy bags because we were going to really seriously play. Uh, you don't see those anymore. And, uh, <laughs> but it fit in there. And it, and it also now fits in your wallet or whatever. And um, it's, it's, it's a handy uh, thing to use. And people have told me about it. And I gave it, uh, whenever I went to events, I brought about, you know, 100, 200. And I just got, got a recent request from, from a Carter Johnson library. And uh, it came out of my own pocket. But it, did, it wasn't like, you know, a major expense because the book was so small and they opened up into a lot of pages and it was a it was a reference guide and with and talking about redoing that too because it, it is slightly dated i don't think much information has changed though you know sugar is still sugar and unless they come up with a cure you know this is what you're doing i got i got the uh i got a community service award for that I'm very surprising very pleased so yeah i got it from uh at the uh one of the one of the black black events, and I was presented by Chip Carter and uh, by Johnson and stuff like that. And I should ask them; they know a lot about my timeline better than I do. Well, I I am going to do an interview with them next month. <laughs> so uh, well, you'll get to Vi. You'll use all your film. <laughs> well. she knows everything. <laughs> Tell us about. Your, I guess it's ffslinger.com. It was a, or is a, globally sexual networking site. Tell us about that. Well, I have the slings, and I think I brought them in from Amsterdam. And I wanted to have a club started here in New York, rent one out. And there was spaces, and they wanted, you know, so much for a door thing and share it and stuff. And these slings are supposed to be portable. And they're portable if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. <laughs> and at the time, we were like, what, uh, 57, 56? And... Uh, we carted them down it, and it was a real hassle. I think it was about four or five slings. And the the owner of the building said he didn't want to store them for some odd reason. Who knows why people do things? And I have a I have a fairly large apartment, and I said, you know, we could do this here. And <laughs> and actually, I set up four sling four. Five slings here and one in the bedroom. And uh, I, I, I had those set up and tarp on the floor and the whole thing and music and Crisco's and towels. Just the regular setup because I, you know, God knows I've been around enough of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little pencil here, a little pencil there. And uh, Actually, now I'm surprised too because my setup is a lot better than some setups in professional, well, in other places that pass. And uh, it was like a lesson I learned in Cuckoo's Nest you can't please everybody. Do it Monday, do it Tuesday, higher lighting, lower lighting. You know, you make yourself crazy trying to make everybody happy. But uh, we got good ideas from them. people. People uh, I had Wednesdays, I had some Fridays, I had Saturdays, I had some Sunday afternoons. And it was for people who were seriously into this thing. And the thing was, the, the, thing, the thing was, do not come over to watch. This is not a tourist site. You either yeah. play, you either play or you have to leave. I said, and it's not because I'm that demanding about it, but this apartment is only big enough for people who are playing. It's not big enough. 
that's not big enough for a meet and greet, you know, <laughs> which eventually my kitchen turned into a meet and greet. But, uh, and, and, word, and word got around very quickly, especially through Europe. My cases through Europe were very good. And uh, it, it, it would catch on in drips and dribbles. You know, like people would love it and they'd come for three to four times and then they didn't. Yeah. And uh, the same, it had the same beginning that Cuckoo's Nest also had. It was a guilty pleasure. It's where the partners of employed partners would come in the afternoon, use the playroom, drink and so forth, but they would keep it a secret so nobody would know. Uh, eventually, though, because there was no ventilation in Cuckoo's Nest at that time, the smell of the beer and the cigarettes would into your clothes, so there was no way you could keep it a secret any longer. But that's the way the fisting party started, too. Everybody liked them, but they didn't want people encroaching on their turf. And they come and they'd say, where's the new people? And I say, how many did you bring? Yeah. And I would do as many uh, promotions, uh, uh, two for one. Uh, if you're coming at this time for five dollars, you can have an extra much of it. Didn't work. Every once in a while, it drop in, but uh, but anyway, even even with that, it ran for ten years, and the the pandemic fell just about the right time. It was uh, okay, fine. This is this is the cutoff. And do I miss it? <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, <clears throat> my partner and I are pretty much up there in years, and we cannot be taking seven slings up and down every week. <laughs> you you have been an activist, a contest judge, a promoter, a bar owner. And of course, a very successful writer. What advice can you offer people who are new to this community? Well, pretty much what I said in the beginning, just be there, be a, be a part of it. You know, it's not even that you have to actively hard participate. You do just be there just to soak up the, the energy, the ideas, the activism. And, and sometimes you'll see something that, oh, I can do that, or I would like to be part of that, or, hey, that's something I can do, you know. Uh, sometimes you, you watch television and you see all these amazing people doing amazing things, and they'll tell you, Oh, I've always wanted this all my life since I was three years old. You know, <laughs> it's going like, you haven't lived yet, but they have. But it doesn't mean you have to start being a kingster at, at three years old. Yeah. <laughs> that would be wrong. But uh, yeah, no, just, just be there. Like if somebody says, I need your help for something, offer a hand. Because everybody's got something to offer, you know. But yeah. uh, don't offer them always sex, because sex sometimes is a lot easier to get than you imagine. <laughs> what are your thoughts on mentoring? Give me an idea. Well, for example, a new person coming into the community, seeking guidance from established people. How do you see working with new people in that uh, particular way? Well, I would like to say, listen, pay attention, be there, don't talk. <laughs> but that would be wrong. Uh. As I, th I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think mentoring goes both ways. I think uh, taking somebody under your wing, I don't know if I could do that, but I think I could a little bit, little ways. 
but I wouldn't want my whole imprint to be on him. I'd also want to learn something from him uh, or her. You know, I'm not about that. And it's, uh, it, I've always considered myself broad. I mean, when I did the, when I started the parties in Cooper's Nuts, the fisting parties, I made them co ed. And of course, oddly enough, there was a lot of flack. And uh, the women didn't stay too long, but they were there. And that's what I wanted. And I put uh, Monica behind the bar. She was the first girl behind the bar, a leather bar in the Cuckoo's Nest. And she was very heavy into leather and very heavy uh, fister. And I was kind of stunned because for Amsterdam, the city with that kind of reputation, they really half came down against her. They wouldn't even let her in their leather bars on Varmestrand. And lost a few customers because of it, but also gained a lot of new customers. Because I've always promoted, you know, it's the same thing also with the, with the fisting thing. I had uh, women come in. Uh, a guy used to come here often, up to the Elmore, and he asked me one day if he could bring his wife. And I said, is she into fisting? And he said, well, she taught me. And she was, and she's been amazing. Whenever she's here, the party rocks. And then she, well, German, another girlfriend of hers was German. And there was, you know, I would have liked to have made movies, but they, but I used to take pictures at the beginning, but it drained the energy when you take the pictures. So I stopped taking pictures. So uh, I could have made movies. But I also, the thing is, having the women there added to the extra energy. And if people would come in and say, well, I don't think I can get a hard on. I say, well, first of all, it's a fisting party. You don't really need one. And I said, second of all, you don't have to have sex with her. I said, there's four slings in the front. And at this time, there were two slings in the back. You don't have to be there. You know, but I, I, I always kind of advocated an all around thing because my experience has always been just because I'm not into it doesn't mean somebody else isn't. Yeah. And I find, I think you meet a lot of interesting people who have a lot of interesting sidelines to their kink that you didn't think about. And uh, there may be five things of this particular kink that's pretty gross to you, but there's one thing in there that really turns you on. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you well, live and learn. What is the biggest misconception about you? About me? What's the biggest misconception? Well, I'm always saying is a lot of people don't see, I can see my people laughing now, rolling their eyes, is that I'm probably more open and compassionate than they think. I mean, when people see me, especially for most of my life, because I've always usually been a big guy, and I think a lot of people are guilty of this too. That as soon as they see you, they tend to label you. And as soon as I enter the room, my reputation and so forth, and just based on, they just automatically assume I'm a on your knees boy type of talk. And that isn't always true, you know. As the saying goes, daddies need daddies too. <laughs> Kane, I've got to thank you for an amazing interview today for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Oh, thanks for some pretty good questions. Had to think about them. Come back to me, of course, when you need me to refer them and find some answers. <laughs> like names of places, times and dates. Uh, 
things that round out the interview. <laughs>